In an ideal future, humanity would run on 100% renewable energy, ideally mixed with nuclear fusion. In the present, our primary means of producing energy has indelibly altered and continues to negatively affect the biosphere. Although implementation and development of renewable energy technologies continues to thrive and there is no shortage of hopeful headlines, there is only one Earth, one humanity, and humanity still overwhelmingly relies on the combustion of fossil fuels. Human prosperity and comfort is intimately connected with the production of energy. The more energy you produce, the more work and technology you can develop and sustain. A society will only benefit from more energy. Although renewable sources for energy continue to make up a greater percentage of energy output, we are using more energy. In fact, the amount of demand for energy is outpacing the installation of renewable energy production. The IEA's roadmap to net zero 2050 requires a global reduction of more than 6% annually in coal-produced electricity. However, 2022 is projected to see a 5% increase and a further 3% in 2023, likely setting new records of emissions from the energy sector. We cannot provide the level of comfort I and many of you enjoy cleanly to the 8 billion people on Earth with today's renewable energy technology. Every person deserves a comfortable, sustainable life, and there's no reason developing nations should be scorned for reaping the benefits of fossil fuel combustion as many developed nations did in the past and present. A better alternative is to present a cleaner, scalable substitute. There are two main concerns with regard to nuclear fission energy. The first is the risk of core meltdowns like we've seen in Chernobyl or Fukushima, and the second is the accumulation of the fuel waste. Today, we're discussing the latter. Before we get too wrapped up in quantum chemistry, we should understand the quantity and context of current nuclear waste. According to the International Atomic Energy Agency, at the end of 2016, roughly 29,000 cubic meters of spent nuclear fuel exists. This is what is classified as high-level waste and is the stuff that can be harmful for tens of thousands of years. The vast majority of waste is low and intermediate level waste and is very abundant. Keep in mind, I don't know the density for this waste, so these volumes are not proportional in terms of mass. It's certainly a significant amount, but only the high-level waste will persist for significant periods of time. Low-level waste comprises just 1% of the radioactivity, yet 90% of the mass, and while not immediately lethal, it will be completely safe within a decade. Therefore, let's focus on the spent nuclear fuel. The U.S. produces roughly 2,000 metric tons of fuel waste each year. That produced 804 terawatt hours of electricity in 2019. This volume represents just the spent fuel and doesn't account for the amount of material that will be needed to encapsulate and shield it from the surroundings. We'll increase the volume 150% to account for this. Comparatively, it would require 328 million metric tons of coal to produce the same amount of energy. Historically, all of this coal would be combusted into the atmosphere. But nowadays, power plants use carbon capture technology. The state-of-the-art methods are said to capture between 80 or 90% of the carbon released. Let's be generous and say it captures 90% of the carbon. Well, 10% still looks like this. 32.7 million metric tons of coal. And of course, not every coal plant around the world is capturing 90% of the CO2 coming out of their stacks. This is problematic, as this waste disappears into the atmosphere and the lungs of people, whereas this waste sticks around. Thus, it's easy to point the finger at nuclear waste and be afraid of it. Now, let me tell you what we can do about this. There are two principal isotopes of uranium in nature, uranium-238 and the more unstable uranium-235. U-235 is the atom that splits during most fission reactions, and its concentration is what separates fuel from waste. Although U-238 is not fizzle, it is fertile. This means it can become fizzle. During the life cycle of the core, it will naturally absorb neutrons turning into U-239. This then beta decays twice into plutonium-239. 
This is the fuel used in the first atomic bombs, and as such will also fission like U-235, providing additional energy to our core. At the end of its three-year-long life, the core comprises roughly 96% uranium, 1% plutonium, and 3% are the byproducts created during fission. It's this phenomenon of 1% plutonium we will be focusing on. Essentially, all commercial nuclear reactors are what are called thermal reactors. This means the neutrons flying around are moving just as fast as any other particles in their environment. Or in other words, they are moving quite slow. Slow-moving neutrons interact very well with the nuclei of atoms, and as such, the slower a neutron is moving, the higher the likelihood of a fission event occurring. But neutrons formed from fission are moving very fast, roughly 14 million meters per second. For ideal fission, we want to slow them down to around 2200 meters per second. To accomplish this, nuclear reactors use moderators to interact with and slow down neutrons. Good moderators accomplish this without also absorbing the neutrons themselves. Water excels at this and thus is found in the cores of the majority of thermal reactors. Because slow-moving neutrons are so easily absorbed, you don't need a ton of neutrons to keep the fission reaction going. So even though U-238 does absorb some neutrons and forms plutonium, it's not happening a lot because there aren't a lot of neutrons. But theoretically, if U-238 absorbed enough neutrons, it could form plutonium just as fast as plutonium undergoes fission, thus slowly burning the incredibly abundant U-238 isotope. Well, this is not just theoretical, but a practical phenomenon. If we look at an ENDF diagram of U-238 interactions with neutrons, we see that the cross-sections for absorption and fission swap at higher energies. This means if an atom of U-238 absorbs a neutron, it's more likely to fission than transmute into plutonium-239. If we can create an environment with high-energy neutrons, we can fission some of this much more abundant isotope. This produces more neutrons that have the possibility of either fissioning another atom or being absorbed by another U-238 atom to then form plutonium-239. On top of this, the most common transuranic elements formed during a reactor's life cycle will also fission when absorbing a fast neutron. If we look at the ENDF diagrams of these byproducts, we see the same trend. A stark decrease in the ability to simply absorb the neutron, and in many, a marked increase in the fission of that element. When compared, these two values are known as the capture to fission ratio. The lower this value, the more likely the nuclei will undergo fission instead of simply absorbing the neutron. This means in a fast neutron environment, large nuclei cannot persist for long periods and will eventually fission down into smaller nuclei. This is of great importance because it is these large nuclei left over in nuclear waste that make it dangerous for tens of thousands of years particularly the plutonium. That's not to negate the danger of the leftover elements. The strontium and cesium isotopes produced are extremely radioactive with half-lives of only about 30 years. But the difference between this 30-year half-life and plutonium-239's 24,000-year half-life is about 24,000 years. Thus, as long as a fast reactor is burning, the volume or mass of long-lived radionuclides that require disposal is constantly shrinking. Despite its efficiency, eventually a fast reactor core will burn through fuel until it's no longer hot enough. At this point, something different happens. Instead of taking our waste away to bury, we reprocess it. This means we separate the plutonium, uranium, and byproducts into individual components. The byproducts are actual waste and will be buried for a couple hundred years, but the uranium and plutonium can be mixed back into a brand new core. This reprocessing can also be done with nuclear waste to form even more fuel. Remember that 1% plutonium formed in our thermal reactors? Well, we can take the plutonium from 20 spent cores and create a new core for our fast reactors. Now I know what you're thinking. Only 5% of nuclear waste can be used? That's um, not super impressive. Well, in fast neutron environments, it's hard for U-238 to not absorb neutrons faster than plutonium-239 fissions. As a result, plutonium-239 builds up inside the core. Eventually, we have too much plutonium and we need to take it out to reduce the concentration. 
we can then combine that with this excess U-238 and voila, we have another core that can be used in a fast reactor. This process then repeats over and over and over and over and it's easy to see how lucrative of a source of power this can be. Reprocessing could produce more fuel for thermal reactors and what is called MOX fuel. But MOX fuel has an increased concentration of plutonium-239. Since we're using thermal neutrons, plutonium-239 has no problem simply absorbing the neutron without fission every now and then. This causes a buildup of the transuranic elements mentioned earlier, which themselves can also absorb neutrons. When the core reaches the end of its life, the leftover fuel waste is even more environmentally dangerous than before due to this increased abundance of large radionuclides. With fast reactors, as long as you have a sustained reaction going, the only large radionuclide you will need to dispose of will be those left over in the core at the end of the reactor's life. So why isn't this happening? Well, the biggest reason seems to be the core's production of plutonium. Scientifically, it seems like a gold mine, but not everyone is pure of heart. U-235 is difficult to separate from U-238 without adequate facilities and components. Thus, plutonium is much more attractive for rogue nuclear entities. One simply needs to steal a few kilograms over time without detection to construct an explosive device, even less for a radiological weapon. Thus, there's justified apprehension to creating multiple facilities around the world with abundant plutonium. The other principal reason is economics. The number of industrial scaled fast reactors produced throughout history can be counted on fingers. So the procedure for reliably and efficiently constructing one hasn't been established. Costs for these plants often balloon beyond predicted and many never finish construction. The multiple reasons and challenges behind these costs will be explored in the next video. Therefore, at the moment, it's not economically viable to invest heavily in this technology. It's not a very compelling argument, as the cost for addressing extreme weather events will balloon far beyond what we will spend on developing any technologies to address it. When we consider the impact on human life and well-being, are you comfortable putting a price on your child's life? Because it is our children who will endure the bulk of consequences of inaction. Inaction, due to economics, is to put a price on their well-being. The world will need more energy in the future for cooling systems, for agriculture, for carbon sequestration, and for raising everyone else out of poverty. Currently, the only viable methods for producing these incredible amounts of energy create waste. Only one of these wastes immediately begins afflicting the biosphere. Both carbon dioxide and nuclear waste can be mitigated or cleaned in the future. But the difference is the harm produced by their existence is not equivalent. Additionally, energy used to clean up nuclear waste can be recouped in fast reactors, whereas the energy from carbon dioxide scrubbing is lost as this waste must be sequestered. In the next video, we'll look at the technology and mechanisms occurring inside modern and future fast reactors. We'll also look at the thorium-uranium fuel cycle and challenge what it means to be a renewable source of energy.